Now, these two accounts of the same incident seem to be saying different things. If you look at the one from Mark, notice Jesus says, everything is possible for him who believes. Now, everything is possible to him who believes what? Or who believes who? Well, the usual interpretation is that everything is possible for him who believes Jesus. Everything is, impo is possible for him who believes in God, who believes in Jesus. That's the uh, traditional interpretation. Now, Matthew says something differently. What Matthew says is, nothing will be impossible for you if you have mountain-moving faith. So how do we reconcile these two seemingly inconsistent accounts? Accounts that are not consistent with one another. Well, let's look at the literal translation of Mark 9, verse 23. Literally, it's the following. And Jesus said to him, If you are able to believe, all things are possible to the ones believing. Now, in the Greek, the word for be to believe is pisteo. And it turns out that the Greek word pisteo can be translated to believe or to have faith. Instead of using the word believe, let's put in the word to have faith. And this is what we get. And Jesus said to him, If you are able to have faith, all things are possible to the ones having faith. Having what kind of faith? Faith of God. All things are possible to the ones having the faith of God. Having mountain moving faith. Having faith as a mustard seed. Now the two accounts are consistent. All things are possible to the one who has faith of God. Nothing is impossible to the one who has mountain moving faith. The two accounts are consistent with one another. Let's look at the one from Matthew 17, 20. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So the two accounts are consistent with one another. When understood correctly, the two accounts do not conflict, but say the same thing. When the disciples on the boat feared the wind and the waves, we studied this just a moment ago. Matthew 8, 26. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. What kind of little faith did they have? What kind of little faith did they have? They had little faith of God. What did Jesus expect them to do? I believe that Jesus expected them to rebuke the winds and the waves. There were different reasons for this. I think one reason was because Jesus was very tired. He had a physical body, and he was ministering day and night. Imagine all the people who came to him wanting to be healed. And he had a chance to get away. He was on the boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and there he could sleep. But his disciples woke him up. Lord, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. I'm sure he was irritated that they woke him up. <laughs> but he expected them to be able to rebuke the winds and the waves. Actually, such miracles are not that uncommon. We have seen them not infrequently. This was in the year 2000. I was in northern India, and we were having open-air crusades. And the Lord was blessing us. We had five crusades. I believe we had two a day for like two and a half days. And every meeting, thousands of people would be showing up. And the Lord was performing miracles. And people were being saved. People were being healed. When I went out to the field for the fourth meeting, when I looked up at the sky, I saw that it was dark. The clouds were heavy. And uh, I could see lightning in the distance, and the wind was picking up. And so it was very obvious that there was going to be a storm. It was not quite seasonal. But by that time, the people had gathered, and so it was too late to do anything, and so we began the service. We began with singing. Now, halfway during the singing, one of the Indian pastors came to me, and he said, Brother William, should we simply tell the people to go home after we finish the singing? because it's going to rain. 
I took it as an attack from the enemy, and I simply was not going to take it. And so I told him, no, we're not going to cancel the meeting. After the worship and praise were over, I climbed up to the platform, and I told the people, I said, the enemy is not pleased with what God has been doing here, so he has sent this storm to scatter us. Let us pray to the Lord and ask him to drive away the storm to the Lord. And so I led them in prayer. There were thousands of people. I led them in prayer, asking the Lord to remove the storm. After, in Jesus' name, amen, what do you think I did? I spoke to the storm. I said, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. I command you to leave now, go in Jesus' name. I rebuke this storm. I rebuke the winds and the waves. Leave in Jesus' name. Well, what do you think happened? Well, God was gracious. God heard our prayer. And this storm split in two. Half of it moved miles away to the north. The other half moved miles away to the south. And in the middle, where we were, there was no rain. Hallelujah. The people saw the miracle. They knew what God had done. They knew the power of our God. And the Lord blessed that meeting with many miracles of healing, people testifying, and people accepting Jesus Christ. Pretend you were living 2,000 years ago, and you were a master, and you had servants. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Would he not rather say, prepare you, my supper, you get yourself ready, you wait on me while I eat and drink, after that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? Now, this is how Jesus answered them when they asked him to increase their faith. Now, what does this have to do with increasing your faith? Well, I'll tell you. It turns out that we, as born-again disciples of Jesus Christ, we have things which are under our authority, like servants. And one of them is the works of the flesh. Before we came to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the works of our flesh, the sinful nature, shall we say, ruled over us. But after we repented of our sin and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, our sinful nature was put to death on the cross. It lost its power over us. And now we rule over the works of our flesh. We have power over our human nature. We are no longer subject to it as a servant. Now it serves us. Yes. Now, notice the disciples asked Jesus, increase our faith. So how do you increase your faith? What kind of faith is he talking about here? Mountain-moving faith. How do you increase your mountain-moving faith? You see, the whole point here is to increase in mountain-moving faith so we can heal the sick and cast out demons effectively. How do we increase in that kind of mountain-moving faith? By exercising authority through mountain-moving faith over the works of our flesh. So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, you should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. What has the Lord told us to do? Well, the Lord has told us to obey him. He has commanded us to do certain things. Among them, preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons, make disciples, and also live a holy life. Let's say... By God's grace, you have managed to obey God's commands. And what should you say after you have obeyed God's commands? You have been fruitful as a servant of God. Should you become proud? Should you say, I am the next apostle? I should go on TV. I think I'll leave and start my own church because I am more anointed than the pastor. Should you say that? No, of course not. But this is a temptation. Many people do that. They, in fact, do such a thing. No, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty.